All right, you guys, well, we want to respect your time and want to thank you for being here tonight. So we're going to get, we're going to get rolling. Um, if you can find a seat, that would be wonderful. And like I said before, I'm glad that we are in here, not in the chapel. Um, if the Padres score, you can just clap once. And if the Dodgers score, boo twice, all right? <laughs> few introductory remarks. Um, I do not read into the color of my shirt, please. It is blue and red, speckled and white also. Um, I am being fact-checked down here by this table and um, I expect that we are gonna have a really good night together. I didn't know how nervous I should be about this evening, but a lot of you came up to me and told me how brave I was for doing this. So that made me more nervous than I was originally. <laughs> um, but I am, uh, I do, feel a sense of weightiness around the subject of how we as Jesus followers interact in this current political climate. Um, as you'll hear in, in sort of my, hopefully my content and my tone tonight, uh, my posture is one of respect for every single person in this room. Um, my, my assumption is you've done uh, your research and that you sort of know why you think what you think and why you believe what you believe. And, um, and, and so uh, just know that I respect you, even if I'm, uh, you may find out tonight that I don't always agree with you. Um, my hope is that you will return the favor to me. Uh, and so uh, let's begin with a word of prayer and then we'll jump in tonight. Uh, Lord, we are so grateful for the chance to, to be together, Lord, to um, come under you and try to wrestle with really weighty and challenging things in this moment of time that you have called us to live within. Lord, you've, you've called us to be, um, many of us, to be citizens of this great country. And, um, and we don't take that lightly. The fact that we live in a republic where our voice matters is such a gift. And so we wanna steward that gift well. We pray that tonight would serve to that end and that ultimately, Jesus, you would be glorified in our midst. It's in your name we pray. Oh, and Lord, <laughs> we lift up all of the people um, in harm's way as this hurricane just barrels down on Florida and on the East Coast. Lord, we, um, we pray for your church there that, um, that in the wake of uh, what looks like it could be disaster, that she would rise up, be your hands and feet in a very tangible way. God, may your love be seen. And Lord, would you just protect people, homes? Um, I know many in this room have people they love that are in harm's way. So we ask for your protection on them in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You thought I was gonna pray for the Padres, didn't you? <laughs> it's fair, should have. Yeah. Well, I want to say thank you for coming tonight. Uh, this uh, 20, uh, 2024 election and politics seminar was one that I had on my heart. Um, even while I was on sabbatical, I just was getting this sense that the church needs to be um, speaking into this moment in a way that honors Jesus. Originally, I asked my wife, hey, do you think I should do a, a seminar on politics in the 2024 election? And she was like, absolutely not. And so, um, babe, I may find out that I really should have listened to you. <laughs> Some of you are here because you're curious about where I stand. Some of you are wondering if I stand on the same side of the aisle as you. Others are here because you're looking for wisdom and guidance in how to vote. Some of you are here because you're concerned about the state of our nation and you really want to know how to engage what is admittedly a really precarious moment faithfully. So at the onset, like I said, I just want you to know that I respect each one of you, even though I'm assuming that there are things that we don't entirely see eye to eye on. I'm a finite human being. Um, I know that doesn't surprise any of you. And there, there are things going on in our country that I'll just admit to you, I, I don't fully get. I don't, know, I, I don't know which way is up with some of them. So I'm asking for your grace because I'm assuming that I'm going to be an equal opportunity offender tonight. If I don't offend you during the session, just come up and I'll offend you afterwards, all right? Um, 
But I'm doing this seminar not as a sermon on a Sunday morning because uh, I want to invite the dialogue and I want to invite you into some of my own personal processing and personal angst uh, around the subject of politics and faith in a way that I don't view as being entirely appropriate from the pulpit at a Sunday worship gathering. So at the onset, let me remind you, I am a pastor, not a politician. That doesn't mean that I don't care about politics. It means that my main desire and my main focus of study is how to preach the gospel, how to do it in a way that hopefully inspires people to follow Jesus, to become disciples, that points them to him and helps them live in his way with his heart, because I believe that's where true change really happens. So that's my goal for tonight. And I ask in advance for your forgiveness of any way that this falls short of that. So there is much fear and trepidation surrounding this election. And it's on both sides. At a fundraiser in February, President Joe Biden called Donald Trump, quote, the one existential threat. He's also written on X, formerly known as Twitter, to his constituents, In this election, your freedom, your democracy, and America itself is at stake. In June, Vice President Harris said, this is the one, this is the one, the most existential, consequential, and important election of our lifetime. I think that was the narrative last election too, but that's a whole nother subject. (laughs) Former President Trump has used the same line of argument when he said at the Faith and Freedom Coalition, This will be the most important election in the history of our country. And this is our one chance, quote, one chance to save America. In March, he responded to the claim that he was, quote, the threat to democracy with, I am not a threat. I am the one who's ending the threat to democracy. Now you listen to both sides and it begins to sound a bit apocalyptic. I mean, if both sides agree, that this is the most important election in the history of the United States of America, and both sides agree that the other is an existential threat, then, man, fear and trepidation might just be the right path forward. However, if you are a follower of Jesus, I want to tell you that this nation is not your only, nor is it your greatest You don't need to buy into the fear-mongering that both sides are peddling and selling. So I'd like to do the best that I can to release uh, sort of the, sort of turn that release valve a little bit. And, And my hope is to release some of the tension that we all feel around this election by grounding us in a bigger story than who wins the 2024 election. Okay. So big picture. Um, Oh, big picture, we, we want your questions, okay? And so throughout this evening, you can go to slido.com number 3344. You can ask questions there and uh, Josh and Jake and Jeremy will get them on a computer and eventually they will get them up on the screen for me or for Penny, who's way smarter than me to answer. She's getting all your hard questions, by the way. Um, so we have some of them up already. And uh, you can even vote and say that you like this question. Click that little uh, thumbs up, uh, uh, thumbs up to the side of the question there. Yeah, see, and it'll start to bump it to the top. If you're, uh, if you don't like using um, uh, Slido, then you can write your questions on a sheet of paper. And occasionally, Lundy and Zach Swinsco will walk down the aisle, and you can um, either put money in the basket or you can put questions in the basket. We'll take both, all right? We will take both, all right? And they'll load those into Slido so that we can uh, field the questions that the majority of the people want answered. Does that sound good? Okay, grounding us in a bigger story. Who are we as followers of Jesus? We are dual citizens. Paul, in writing to the church in Philippi, wrote to them and said, but our citizenship is in heaven And we eagerly await our savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. We are citizens 
of heaven. Or if you want to look at it like this, we are citizens, uh, many of us, of the United States of America. And at the, the same time, we are citizens of the kingdom of God. Paul was writing to the church in Philippi. Philippi was a um, notorious for a colony that Roman soldiers retired in. So this was a controversial statement that Paul makes to the church back then. And I, I think we should accept it as a fairly controversial statement for us in the United States today. The early Christians, you just need to know this, the early Christians were not waiting on Caesar to save them. They were waiting on Jesus. They were saying that Jesus has saved, is saving, and will save. Jesus was very, very clearly their hope. And I would say that he is ours as well. So we are dual citizens, kingdom and empire, number one. Number two, as the church, we are a multi-ethnic international family. That's foundational to who we are as Jesus followers, and we cannot lose sight of that when we go to the ballot box on November 5th. It is, yes, November 5th. Galatians chapter 3, verse 28 says, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all, what? One in Christ. Neither Jew nor Greek meant that nationalities and ethnicities that once divided within the church do so no longer. That the blood of Jesus brings people together in a way that nothing else in the history of the world has been able to do on a consistent basis. Does that make sense? So this is, who, this is who we are on a core identity level. Listen to what Peter writes to the churches. This is, this, is, this is earth-shattering, groundbreaking good news. He says, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a, say it with me, holy. a holy nation. God's special possessions that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. I don't know if we have plumbed the theological and practical depths of 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 nearly enough. Because when Peter writes this letter to the churches, he says to them, you are a holy nation. Go back and read 1 Peter chapter 1 and 2. He's not talking about the nation of Israel. He's talking about Jesus followers who are now viewed as, quote, a nation. It's a really, really interesting turn of phrase. It's, it's unexpected. And I think when we start to put all of these together, here's what we start to see. We are Christians first, and we are everything else second. We are Christians first and Americans second. We are Christians first and Republican second. Christian first, Democrat second. Christian first, every other affilia affiliation second. This is the game changer, friends. Fourth, I wanna be very, very clear. We are electing a president but we already have a king. Amen. Acts chapter 17, verses six and seven, um, Dr. Luke is recording this and he says, these men, they've caused trouble all over the world and they've come here now. And Jason has welcomed them into his home. They are defying Caesar's decrees, decrees saying that there is another king, one called Jesus. If this sounds like it has political implications, it's because it did. Massive political implications. To say that Caesar was not Lord, that Jesus was, to say that Caesar was not king, that Jesus was, was a game changer in the Roman Empire. It could have gotten you killed in the Roman Empire. How did the early Christians turn, quote unquote, turn the world upside down? They said that there was another king. The way to turn the world upside down is not by electing the right president. It's by anointing the right king. His name is Jesus. He is seated on the throne. And we very, very clearly worship him 
alone. Amen? Amen. Fifth and finally as part of our introduction. We live as exiles waiting for a homeland. And that is um, regardless of who's president. Regardless of how, um, how much of a utopia the United States starts to feel like or returns to feeling like. Like, regardless of how good it gets, we're waiting for a homeland. We are exiles in waiting. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 14 to 16. People who say such things show that they're looking for a country of their own. Notice the national language, the, the, the implication that we are a nation. They're looking for a country of their own. If they'd been thinking of the country they'd left, they would have no opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Friends, we are still longing for a better country. And not the kind where we like, elect the right president and then like, the right things happen here. It's always going to fall short of our deepest and most profound longings. Can I get an amen, please? We are looking for a heavenly country, one where Jesus gets his way, where God is glorified and where people live under submission to him. All right, our posture towards others. So that's sort of big picture, who are we? That's who we are. We are citizens of heaven. We are people who are a nation together under Christ, multi-ethnic, international family. That's who we are our posture as Christians. Um, this one's close to my heart because um, I, I wanna choose my words as carefully as I can tonight. Uh, I do care how you vote, but I care just as much about how you interact on Facebook and the kind of posture that you have towards other people in your life and the, the things that you retweet or the things that you post on X or whatever, wherever your platform of choice is. Like, I, I think so much of our message is, um, it, it goes beyond just the content of what we say. It's the heart with which we say it. And so this is what that, this section is all about. Number one, I was thinking of framing this in a um, Sermon on the Mount phrase. So here's my attempt at that, it's not this. You have heard it said, <laughs> vote your biblical conscience. But I say to you, vote your biblical conscience and live your biblical character, <laughs> both. So don't leave your Christian convictions at the door when you vote, but don't leave your Christian attitude at the door either. At the ballot box, or on whatever public social media or just interactive platforms that you are on. I, I um, started to think initially like, gosh, I just, I should have done some sort of sermon series that outlined some of the things that we're gonna talk about over the next few minutes. And then I thought, I'm doing that sermon series. <laughs> Teaching through the Sermon on the Mount is a call to live our Christian identity in areas where it's really challenging and really hard and where there's a lot of pushback. I mean, it turns out that things like do unto others as you would have them do unto you, the challenge to pray for those who persecute you, the admonition not to let anger reside in your heart, it turns out those are all very, very applicable when it comes to the 2024 election, aren't they? Unfortunately, there's a message that people often receive from Christians, and it's typically not direct. It's typically more something that they just catch or feel. I think it's embodied in a, a comment that was pointed out to me on a New York Times article. Someone commented on the article and said, there's no hate like Christian love. And... Um, I mean, you guys, I, I guess my heartbeat is that that saddens me. And I think I understand where a lot of it comes from. Like we, we live in a cultural moment where you almost feel like you have to express outrage to feel like your voice is being heard. Like the, the volumes just get ratcheted up more and more and more and the vitriol and the hatred and the narrative just gets, it's just ratcheted up and up and up. And you, you almost feel like in order to be heard, I've got to say it's so extreme and I've got to be abrasive and I've got to be offensive. 
And um, I guess I just want to suggest to you that that doesn't feel like the way of Jesus to me. And I think that there's a better way. And I hope that as Jesus followers, there's a way that we can start to speak a better, kinder, more loving word that's more reflective of our king so that this narrative starts to change. Number two. So Christian character and Christian ethics. Number two, um, seek to understand. Seek to understand. Ask, ask better questions. Try to figure out where people are coming from. Everyone has a story and every story matters to God. Under this, I would also say, assume the best. Assume the best about people. Assume the best about me, please. <laughs> but seek to understand. Third, see people, not just issues. See people, not just issues. When we're talking about politics, we are talking about our common life together. That means that the issues are not simply thought experiments. They're not just questions. They're not just contemplative ethics. They are about people. So the language that we use, the posture that we use, the tone that we use in all of this matters because people matter. And, and, and can we just get back to the truth that you can disagree with somebody and still love them? I, I think one of the enemy's greatest tactics in our current cultural moment is that if you disagree with somebody, you automatically hate them. Unfortunately, oftentimes it devolves into that, but it doesn't need to go that direction. You can love people who you disagree with, even online. <laughs> Fourth, Seek to find common ground. And, and I know that maybe some of you are going, listen, they're, they're, those people, whoever those people are in your mind, I have nothing in common with them. And, and what I've found, the more questions I ask people, is that typically underneath um, all of the narrative and all of the spin and all of the propaganda, typically underneath there's a core where most, most people, not all, most people want good for other people. Most people want good for themselves. And what we disagree about oftentimes is the pathway on how to get to that good and the pathway on how to get to that flourishing, the pathway on, on how to make our nation flourish and prosper. We disagree on the pathway of how to get there, but we don't disagree, typically, on the desire to get there. And I'm saying... I think around the water cooler at work, you could focus on finding common ground as a way that starts to build rapport with others. And then finally, um, please, 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 be discerning about where you get your information. Um, all right, I'm just gonna tell a quick story, okay? Uh, I, I stopped drinking soda around 11 years ago, and um, this applies, I promise. And now, uh, like, I, I couldn't choke a soda down, a Coke down to save my life. I'm not bragging, just saying, okay? Um, I don't watch a lot of the news, okay? When it's on in my house accidentally because some family members are visiting, <laughs> when it's on, it feels like a soda to me. I'm like, there's so much anger. There, there's this stirring of chaos and it, and it it doesn't matter which news outlet you watch, they all play the same game. Different flavor, same game. It's all soda. You stop watching it for a little while and you will dive back in and go, wow, I can't believe this was ever palatable. All right, so in light of that, um, I'm not saying, listen, I'm not saying don't watch the news. I am saying a thought experiment might be what if you stopped watching it for about a week, just read, and then went back in and saw how it felt? Try it. Try it. Um, okay, so how do you become a discern discerning about where you get your information? Um, here's a few ideas for you. Number one, read various sources. Read various sources. I, I, I think... It's probably not the wisest thing to just have one news outlet that you go to and you take everything that they say as gospel truth, okay? 
Number two, um, you may want to look at allsides.com. It's a way to analyze where the news outlet that you're reading falls along the right left political spectrum. Okay? And I'm not saying that you shouldn't read articles on the left or on the right. You should just be aware that that is the bias of the news that you're reading. Just be aware. Um, a few suggestions that people gave me were BBC or even India Times in order to get an international flavor on the news that you're consuming because people in different countries have a little bit of a different view on what's going on in the United States. That's helpful. Um, and then uh, Reuters, uh, Luke Bansky said that, uh, I'm going to blame him for that one since I don't read a lot of it, but he said it tends to be fairly central, F- fairly, fairly. A few podcasts that have been recommended. Um, One is Breaking Points, and you can get this on uh, wherever podcasts are found. This has a a conservative and a liberal, it's long form dialogue. So uh, their interviews with each other, when they interview each other, dialogue is about an hour and a half. My suggestion, listen to it on 1.5 speed, at least maybe two on a run, okay? But it's a way to sort of see what both sides are thinking and they tackle issues that are really, really pertinent to our day and our time right now. Somebody on our staff said that they listen to the newsworthy almost every morning. It's about 10 minutes, bite-sized, and it tends to be um, fairly, quote unquote, neutral, okay? Um, It's not easy to be a discerning uh, consumer of information in our day and our time. Can I get an amen? It's very, very challenging. And if you walk out of this space with nothing else other than that tonight, we may have done our job, all right? It's really challenging. I would highlight the work that Penny Harrington and the Biblical Citizenship team do. The the briefing that Penny does every month is phenomenal. It's phenomenal. And there are hours and hours and hours that go into researching and studying. You can sign up to get that. um, uh, You can sign up tonight to be added to their distribution list. And she is digging into things going on, uh, mostly on a state level. um, And it's really, really, really helpful, okay? Okay, next, God's people and political engagement. I just wanna give you a big picture, sort of where have God's people landed over the course of time. Um, In Jesus's day, you had Pharisees and they walked sort of the middle path between revolution and submission. They focused on religious purity and social reform within the existing political framework. That's sort of, I think, what many people in the States view as uh, the way that Christians interact today. On the other hand, you had Sadducees who were more willing to collaborate with the Roman officials in order to keep their wealth, their power, and control over their religious life intact. So these were people that were like, we are all in with the political leaders of our day. So much so that the Bible will be secondary and Rome will be primary. The Essenes. Anybody know who the most famous Essene was in the scriptures? Yes, John, John, John the Baptist, right? Goes and lives out in the Qumran community. The Essenes were separatists. They're like, we're out. Thank you very much. These would be like the Mennonites and the Anabaptists, the Amish. They're like, we're, we're just out all together. And then the Herodians, they were more interested in political gain than they were with religious concerns. And their main focus was on preserving Herod's power and maintaining Roman favor. That's what they wanted to do. Okay, so how should we engage? Jesus said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. It's interesting that that Jesus didn't side with any of the four main categories of his day. He was doing something entirely different. He was calling people into a different kingdom, a different kind of transformation, one that was rooted in love and justice. The phrase that encapsulates encapsulates his approach, I think, is his mission was to challenge the authority of his day with a higher calling, a calling from God himself. So how should we engage? Um, I think that's the question that many of us are here to answer. And I think how we should engage is by living out the greatest and second greatest command, to love God and then to love others. That when we vote, what should be most in our head is to love others as 
we love ourselves, okay? How do we do that? How do we do that in the current political climate? Um, I have a lens that I think through whenever I think about politics and situations and issues that we find on our ballot. Here's my sort of threefold lens. I wanna think about issues theologically. What does scripture say about them? Globally, what's going on around the, in the church all around the world? How would somebody who's a Jesus follower in the underground church in China feel like this issue that I'm voting on? Because that starts to give a little bit more clarity to the issues that we seem are like really, really pressing for us and for our brothers and sisters who are worshiping at the peril of their life, it starts to put it in context a little bit. And then finally, historically, what has the church historically said about these issues? Does that make sense? Theologically, globally, and historically. All right, I'm gonna um, skip a quote by a long quote by Bonhoeffer. Uh, just say Bonhoeffer's got some good stuff to say, okay? <laughs> and the point of his quote is that as God's people, we must preserve our prophetic voice to speak into each political party rather than saying we're just gonna vote along party lines. So what's most important to Jesus followers is to be a voice uh, sometimes of change, sometimes of conviction, sometimes of wrong, like this is wrong. And that's not just on one side of the aisle, you guys. It's on both sides of the aisle that we would be a prophetic voice over choosing party lines. Okay, 2024 election specifics. Number one, vote. Like vote, vote, please vote. Vote your biblical conscience, like we said. And there are times when I think because what, what, we live in a large state, n number one, um, there are times where you start to think, man, my, my voice just doesn't matter. But I think Penny's gonna talk about this a little bit. There are a number of local races where your voice really does matter. Like they will be decided in a very small percentage. And so I just wanna encourage you, get out there and vote. See this as a way to love your neighbor as yourself. That's one of the ways we live out the greatest commandment in the gift that we have of living in a republic. Okay, so... 2024 election, what is important, that I'm just, just, just from me, from, from sort of my heart to yours, what's important to me in the 2024 election? These are in no particular order. Let me talk about a few of them in more in depth. I'm gonna read them all and then go back through. Number one, um, life is important to me. Number two, character and competency both matter. Immigration matters to me, rhetoric and policy. Foreign policy matters to me. Care for the poor matters to me. The economy matters to me. Sexuality and parental rights matter to me. And religious liberty matters to me. Now, let me um, give a little bit of a, an extended word on a few of these. And I'm gonna pick what may end up being the two most controversial. Um, number one, let's talk about life. Let's talk about the issue of abortion, but let's not stop with caring about life for the unborn. Let's talk about life from preborn all the way up until the grave. Because if life matters, all life matters. And I believe that it does. Um, the early church, I'm not sure if you're aware of this, the early church was known for rescuing babies that were thrown out into garbage heaps. They, would, they were known for going to rescue them, preserving their life, because from the get-go, you guys, from the get-go, you need to hear this, Christians, Judeo-Christian values from the get-go have been every person is created in the image of God and every life matters to God. Now, because um, I've had a few people come up to me and say, listen, Ryan, how in the world could somebody be a Democrat and a Christian because of the issue of abortion? Okay, so let me, and, and so 
I've tried my best to practice what I preached earlier and to just to listen and to ask questions, okay? So here's, because I believe that there are both Republicans and Democrats here, okay? That we have Republicans and Democrats in our church body. So how in the world, to answer that question, could somebody be a Democrat and a Christian? Um, First, I think it's important to note that uh, Donald Trump's stance on abortion has changed. Um, and I don't, I don't wanna speak for him. I'm not exactly sure what his stance is currently. The most recent thing that I heard was that he is um, against abortion after 20 weeks, okay? So against late-term abortion. Now, if you're wondering what percentage of abortions are late-term abortions, it's 1.3% of abortions. Um, and the majority of those are because of health complications for the mom, okay? So, and we can, we can talk about that, but I'm just, that's just the reality. So how in the world could a Christian also vote for a pro-life or pro-choice candidate? Um, I, here's, here's what I would say, that the goal for Jesus followers, because we believe in the image of God and the value of all people is no abortions. And before we see that become a reality in the kingdom of God, um, the goal is fewer abortions, right? Right. So then the question becomes, what's the pathway to fewer abortions? And I, I just would tell you guys, if I thought the pathway to fewer abortions was only policy and was only if you vote for the right candidate and have the right laws, then abortions will go down. I could see being a single issue voter. The reality is that this, the abortion issue is a very complicated issue, not morally, but just how do we decrease the number of abortions? That's a complicated issue. Let me give you factors that should be included when we talk about how to decrease the number of abortions. Number one, resources available to single parents. More resources available, fewer abortions. Sex education and access to affordable contraception, socioeconomic issues, cost of health care for single moms, education and employment opportunities for women, and the stigma around single parenting. So it's, it's just not as simple as if we just have the right policies, then we're going to see abortion end. I wish it were. It's not. The question becomes, what's the best path forward to see fewer abortions and the answer to that is, man, there's a lot of factors that really, really matter. And you should look at all of them and hold them before God as faithfully as you can. And knowing that it's not just that factor of um, policy on abortion that's going to either increase or decrease the number of abortions. The other thing that will dramatically increase or decrease it is the economy and the kind of care we give to the poor. Like that, that, that matters. Here's a second one that I want to talk about. Um, actually, there's, there's three, if that's okay. <laughs> Character and competency. There's a, there was a phenomenal sermon that's been circulating um, by a pastor named Gary Hamrick. Has anyone seen this? I mean, almost a million people watched the sermon. It was, it was I, I, a lot of it was wonderful. He made the point in that sermon that we should uh, vote based on policy, not personality. And to that I say, time out. Time out. Because in the 1990s, Christians expressed outrage at President Clinton for his moral failure. So Franklin Graham in 1998 in a Wall Street Journal op-ed wrote and said, after the Monica Lewinsky scandal, to the notion, quote, to the notion that what a person does in their private life has little bearing on his public actions or job performance, even as the president of the United States, is a misnomer. Gary Bauer, the president of uh, an organization called American Values, chided Clinton for lying about the Lewinsky scandal, saying day after day, children hear adults saying that it doesn't matter that the president lied. Character, he stated, is destiny. James Dobson told his followers that he was, quote, alarmed at the, quote, willingness of my fellow citizens to rationalize the president's behavior after they suspected and later knew that he was lying. Dobson claimed in 1998, quote, 
if you can't run a family, you can't run a family, let alone a country, without character. How foolish to believe that a person who lacks honesty and moral integrity is qualified to lead a nation and the world. Lest you think that this is a comment about one candidate, neither of the candidates are a bastion of morality. Neither of them are. My point is simply as Christians, I don't think that we should say character or call it personality. We're talking about character, that character doesn't matter. It does matter. It matters deeply. And we may say and decide policy matters more than character. That we can make that decision. But let's, let's just not be people who say that character doesn't matter. Because as I read through scripture, it clearly does. It matters in your home. It matters in our church. And it matters in our country. So I just think that knife needs to cut both ways. Finally, immigration. And then I'll stop here. I promise. This is a really delicate issue. Really delicate issue. Um, but one that it, it, there seems to be a ton of narrative around right now when it comes to the 2024 election. Um, I love pastoring a church where we have both border patrol agents and undocumented workers. Where we have natural born citizens and we have immigrants who have dual citizenship. Like this is, you guys, this is a part of being, the beauty of being a part of the church and I say that to make the point that this issue, like all issues on the ballot, is ultimately about people. It's ultimately about people. Now, my personal view is that immigration right now in the United States is an absolute mess. It is a disaster on almost every level. And there are countries that are suffering and people that are hurting. And so a number of people are flooding our borders. That is a reality. But we are followers of Jesus. And so let me encourage you, let me beg with you on this issue. Let's not resolve the tension. Let's preserve it. That the scriptures are very clear that God sets forth boundaries and that having national borders is not an evil thing, it is a good thing, number one. Number two, let's never forget that part of our calling is to care for the foreigner, the fatherless, and the widow. And that is a tension that as Jesus followers, we need to maintain, not resolve. And so I said in my points that, um, that both the rhetoric around immigration and the policies around immigration both matter to me deeply. Okay. Ah. All right, parental rights, really quick. Parental, you guys, parental rights is a huge thing. Um, when, uh, when we're looking at what's going on in our world, and I would just say that uh, I have deep fear of, um, the state parenting my kids rather than me parenting my kids. Amen. And so um, I just firmly believe I'm a way better parent and I'm not afraid to say that. And so part of the way that I'm gonna vote is gonna be in line with that. Um, religious liberty is a huge deal. The economy being healthy and vibrant is attached to almost everything else. And so that's a big deal to me. Um, and then let me tell you uh, finally, uh, one that's a really big deal to me. Um, you, you probably are aware of Prop 3 that's on the ballot, and I'm going to ask Penny to come up, and she's going to talk about more of the propositions on the ballot. I'm not telling you who to vote for president. I, I'm, I'm not telling you how to vote on a lot of things. This is one that um, I'm going to step out on a limb and say, I would love for you to vote no on this. I'd love for you to vote no on Prop 3. Prop 3 is a redefinition of marriage in a very dangerous way. And let me just read you a quote from, um, this, is, this is from voterguide.sos.ca.gov. So this is not a Christian bent. Proposition 3 removes, so this is where you can find like the positives and the negatives of a prop. This is the negative. 
Proposition 3 removes all rules for marriage, opening the door to child marriages, incest, and polygamy. It changes California's constitution even though same-sex marriage is already legal. By making moms and dads optional, it puts children at risk. This careless measure harms families and society. And I would just say I agree that it does and would encourage you um, to vote no on Prop 3. Uh, I said at the very beginning of this that uh, Penny is way smarter than me. As you're going to see that in a moment. Um, she's also, this is her thing. And um, she is a huge resource for our church and just such a gift to us. So let me hand it off to Penny and she's going to talk about the propositions. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. Thank you for your kindness. Thank you so much. So we are um, the Biblical Citizenship Committee. And you can find us on the church's website, efcc.org slash biblical dash citizens. And you can find all that we do there. Um, we provide a monthly briefing, as Pastor Ryan mentioned, on legal, legislative, and policy issues, resources to help you find out more information about those topics, how do you can communicate with your legislators. We put on seminars from time to time. And there's even a resource on there um, just that includes all sides, actually, where you can find good information and, and look for it. So um, right now, I want to talk about our voter resource, though. We, when, if you go to our website, you'll see a couple of, of uh, links to click on here. One's going to be this event. This is recorded, going to be recorded, or it is being recorded. And you'll be able to watch it in a few days, whenever it gets put up on our website. So it'll be on the YouTube channel. I think we're going to have this slide deck as well. So you can find voter resources there. I'd actually ask you to download it. There are some copies of this resource, hard copies, in the lobby. Some of you probably picked those up on your way in. So, uh, but if you download it from the website, it's a PDF with links that you can click on and go right there without having to type everything in. And if you're me, you get it wrong and you get frustrated and you have to find it again. So, so um, we are going to go ahead and talk about our ballot and what's on it. So the first thing we're going to do is ponder the propositions. Do you all get one of these? You love it, don't you? It's just full of great information. You were just waiting till it came so you could look at it. First thing, though, we're going to do always is pray for wisdom when you're talking about your ballot. These are big decisions. So what are the propositions? These are laws made by us. We are the legislature when it comes to these 10 statewide propositions on the ballot. So it's really important that we understand what they are. Laws by the people. To prepare for it, you want to review the title and summary that you find in here, okay? Not just the little bit that's in the, your sample ballot or that's on your ballot. There's a lot more than that, and you want to be sure you really understand it before you vote yes or no. So you're going to review the title and summary, the analysis by the legislative analyst. It sounds like a lot of words, and it is a lot of words to read, but the analyst is usually pretty fair in the way that they put this information together. Then you're going to review the arguments for and against and note who the proponents and the opponents are. That will tell you a lot. You'll say, oh, I know that organization. I don't really like that. I know that organization. Oh, if they're for it, I think I would be for it too, vice versa. Now, also, I would suggest reading the entire text in here, but your eyes have already glazed over, so I probably shouldn't suggest that. So. It's hard to make these decisions that affect large, large amounts of funding, a lot of money that we're voting for on this ballot, and taxes and all of that, and major changes to policies. So when in doubt, consider the old ad adage, vote no. When in doubt, vote no. I mean, why would you vote yes for something you don't understand? So you can always vote no if you're not sure. So we're going to run through these 10 ballot measures really fast, just so maybe you get a little bit more insight into what they're about. But it has to go fast, so buckle up. Here we go. 
Um, Pastor Ryan, first of all, mentioned Proposition 3, um, that the welcome to the slippery slope uh, proposition. And what I would um, encourage you to do is go to proposition3.net. I don't have that on a slide for you, but it's pretty easy. Proposition3.net, and there's a lot of information there. Alliance Defending Freedom has posted their legal analysis, so have other firms. National Center for Law and Policy here in Escondido has uh, analysis there as well. Lots of just information, as well as a little seminar that they put on about it, so you understand more about Proposition 3 and what it means for marriage and for children. Propositions 2 and 4 are bonds. Everybody loves bonds, right? Like, oh, not that again. Okay, Proposition 2 is a school bond for facilities, improvements, safety, $10 billion bond with, they don't come for free, right? Uh, with interest of $8 billion over 35 years. So we will pay for it, our kids will pay for it, and our grandkids will pay for that, the school bond. This large public debt has kind of become the norm rather than the state budgeting for funding for its revenue in this regard. Proposition four is a climate bond, stuff like reduction of flooding risk, water quality. I think we voted for a water quality bond before, at least once. Um, and um, restoration of natural areas, um, so that type of thing, renewable energy, another $10 billion, more interest this time, $9.3 billion in interest, because it's over 40 years. That's for your family to pay for in the future. So the thing to ponder, if we're pondering these propositions, is these are to be repaid from the state's general fund. Could those state funds be reallocated in the budget to provide for school construction and water resources? Is there a way the state could use its money differently? And has there been accountability for prior bond measures passed? Were the intended purposes realized? It? Just things to ponder as you look at it. Proposition five, this is a state constitutional amendment. It's gonna go right into the Constitution of California. It will lower the voter threshold for local bonds. Currently, everybody remember Prop 13 in 1978. Well, not everybody here remembers it. They weren't here in 1978. I remember it a lot. Who said they weren't even alive? <laughs> oh, okay. All right. So Prop 3 said two-thirds, 66.67%. You needed to lower the voting threshold for local bonds. This would take it down to 55% to issue bonds for broadly defined affordable housing and infrastructure. What does it mean? It makes it easier to raise taxes on property owners and approve local bond indebtedness. So ponder, should there be more agreement than 55% when homeowners will be facing higher property taxes and renters higher rents as landlords pass along those higher property taxes to the renters. So we can ponder that. Prop 6, another constitutional amendment. This one removes the provision um, for incarcerated persons to be required to work assignments as punishment for their crime. These are, this is not breaking rocks and stuff like that. This is cleaning and um, cooking and other things with regard to their facility. It's not hard labor. So that's what Proposition 6 um, would do. It allows them to work voluntarily and earn credits, but it would prohibit the ability to discipline an inmate for refusing a work assignment by withholding privileges or something like that. Ponder, should working while incarcerated for crimes be part of restitution for victims or society in general? Does work provide a purpose for people who are incarcerated? So that's what Prop 6 is all about, involuntary servitude, incarcerated persons working while they're imprisoned. Proposition 32. This one raises the minimum wage from currently what it is is $16 to $18 next year, and then starting in 2027, and every year after that, it will raise the minimum wage based on inflation or cost of living. So, ponder. 
does the increase take into account the skill level? No, it doesn't. It just increases automatically. Could it result in the loss of some entry-level jobs? And could it make it more difficult for businesses, particularly small businesses, to stay competitive or stay in business if the minimum wage continues to rise? Okay, that's Prop 32. Prop 33, okay. <laughs> 33 and 34 are kind of related and they're kind of confusing, and they're even maybe a little convoluted, so stick with me here, okay? Prop 33 is about local rent control. There's currently a law passed in 1995 called the Costa-Hawkins Rental Housing Act. Like, oh, really? Okay, it prevents cities and counties from implementing rent control on residences built after 1995, when this was passed, and allows landlords to set their own rental rates when new tenants occupy their property. Two previous attempts, 2018 and 2020, to do this rent control have died. And then, of course, certainly rents are very high. I mean, housing is off the charts. Rent is really, really high, so it makes it compassionate to want to control the rent. Things to ponder. Could rent control create a disincentive for investors to build new construction or upgrade existing property. Opponents warn that repealing current law could profoundly impact the rental industry negatively and then the families involved. Owners will probably sell, some of them will, rental housing and the as the values go down under rent control. And it means that fewer units may be available for rent it could also result, as values go down, lower tax revenue for cities. Okay. An interesting fact, a proponent, because I want you to remember this, a proponent of Prop 33 is the AIDS Healthcare Foundation. Okay. It's one of the major proponents. If you look in your favorite book, you'll see that the AIDS Healthcare Foundation is one of the major proponents. So, Prop 34. You've probably seen ads about 33 and 34. California leaving. Okay. <laughs> Prop 34 is about patient spending. What in the world do these two things have to do with each other? I'll tell you. Okay. Under federal law, health care providers may obtain discounts on pharmaceuticals if they service low income or high risk patients. Then they can sell those drugs at retail value and use the money that they save to provide care for disadvantaged groups of people. Prop 34 requires healthcare providers that meet its specific criteria to pro prove that 98% of all of that money goes to direct patient care. If not, then there are all these penalties involved. So the criteria established in Prop 34 makes it only apply to one organization Guess which one? The AIDS Healthcare Foundation. It only applies to them in, that, in the way that it's written. I mean, I have this thing that's like red circles around here because they own rental property. It's, see how these are tied together? It's crazy. Okay, so that's why you're seeing ads that say yes on 33, no on 34. Headlines about AIDS Healthcare Foundation. AIDS Healthcare Foundation settles with tenants over conditions in Skid Row apartment building. I mean, they're headlines out there all over the place, recent ones. So the assertion is that it's been diverting funds from these monies that are meant for patients and putting them in housing projects. So the question is, does this, could this create a precedent for using the initiative process to go after particular organizations? Just something to ponder as you look at this, regardless of how you feel about how this is written. It's specifically for that one organization. Prop 35, we're almost done with this part. <laughs> <laughs> Prop 35, okay, this makes, okay, the healthcare tax. Okay, lawmakers have dramatically expanded Medi-Cal in the last 10 years to include low-income residents, regardless of citizenship, and the benefits have increased. So Medi-Cal has gone up and up and up. About a third of the state's population uses Medi-Cal. Some say almost 40% um, use Medi-Cal. 
but reimbursement rates to providers are low, so a lot of them won't take the patients. Prop 35 would require the state to spend money from a tax on managed care organizational providers permanently on Medi-Cal. Right now, the state tells it, uh, the state legislature tells it every few years how to spend this particular tax on the providers. So there's really, the, both major parties agree on Prop 35 and the legislative analyst says it doesn't, they don't know the long-term fiscal benefits. The only opposition I could find was Governor Newsom has indicated he will oppose the measure even though there's no official registered opposition group because, it's interesting, it restricts how the tax revenue is spent and hamstrings the legislators and the governor in the ability to ban advance or um, balance the state budget. So that's Prop 35. Okay, last one. Criminal penalties. Reinstates felony charges for certain theft and drug-related crimes. In other words, make crime illegal again. <laughs> right? Some of it. Okay, you may remember in 2014, we the people of California passed Prop 47. It created reforms in the penal code that reclassified many theft and drug possession charges and crimes as misdemeanors instead of felonies, like shoplifting up to $950, misdemeanor. And we've seen the result. You know, try to go to you know, Walgreens or something and get something that now you have to wait for somebody to unlock the cabinet and all of that. At least we have some things on shelves here. There are communities that everything is behind a locked door. So Prop 36 will walk back some of Prop 47. Shoplifting, burglary, carjacking would be a felony after the two convictions. You have to have a couple of convictions before it's a felony. It creates a treatment mandated felony. It's an opportunity for drug treatment and rehabilitation instead of incarceration in prison. Um, if treatment is refused, prison time would be imposed. Interestingly, drug dealers under this must be warned that they can be charged with murder if someone dies from taking their drugs. It's part of it. So, okay. That is Prop 36. So, in looking at the propositions, so you can get more information, um, on biblicalvoter.com, um, you have that if you picked up the packet or if you um, will look at it online, Caser's call, Frank Caser does statewide propositions, county and city measures too. There are 40, <laughs> there are 40 county and city measures on the ballot. So probably not too many on your individual, but that's a lot. This is an example of personal recommendation only. And none of these websites are necessarily endorsed by Emmanuel Faith Community Church. You saw a disclaimer a little bit earlier in the slides. It's just for your information only to go on these websites. They're not related to what we do here at EFCC. Um, another one that you might be interested in for the proposition, is it's not in what you, the written material, but Cal Matters is a nonprofit up in Sacramento. They have a really good voter guide, and it includes the propositions, calmatters.org, California Voter Guide 2024. So that's a good one. And then for the local measures, whether you agree or disagree on exactly how they conclude, whether for or against the tax, there are a lot of sales tax increases and school bonds and other on the, the ballot. Um, San Diego County Taxpayers Association has in-depth policy papers on each one. So if you really want to read, you know, should I like this or not like this, they're very fair in what they go through. Some cities have been better at managing how they spend their taxes, their sales tax revenues. So they go into that. So what about candidates? We're not going to really go over candidates and stuff tonight, but I want to tell you how you can find out more about them. So we have a section in the voter guide or the voter resource that where you can find voter guides, party platforms, links to websites, and here's that disclaimer, referrals to websites not created by ESCC are for informational purposes and do not imply an endorsement of the contents of those sites. Okay, so that's that. <laughs> a thank you from the pastor for that one. Okay, this one, really simple, familyvoterinfo.org. This simply lets you go and see what, can, what organizations endorse which candidates. 
Sometimes you agree with an organization or you know you don't agree with an organization. The organizations, it, there's a way for you to find out what, who they are and look up their website, see if you agree. Then you'll look up your candidate and it will have, there's a little letter next to the candidate with the organizations that endorse that candidate. It also has a link to their websites if you want to go look up the candidate website. So that's a pretty handy one. Then uh, iVoterGuide rates candidates on a scale, kind of liberal to conservative, and then it goes way in depth, but it's mo mostly just federal candidates, a few school boards, they're starting to do some school boards on there. Even deeper research, vote smart, boy, especially if it's somebody who's been in office or an incumbent, there's ratings from organizations, there's speeches that they've done, there's all the funding that they've received for uh, some for the candidates who aren't incumbents, but mostly for those who are. So that's a really great, uh, ratings by the special interest groups is really interesting too. And there are lots of voter guides at biblicalvoter.com. So you can just spend a lot of time clicking your way through biblicalvoter.com. So my challenge to you is do your research. Don't rush, there's not, you know, just if you turn your ballot in earlier, it isn't like it's golden or it gets, you know, you get to vote for two. <laughs> we don't live in Chicago. <sighs> I can say that because I'm from there, okay? I can say that. Yeah. Richard, J. Daly, all that stuff. Anyway. So your vote matters. And as Pastor Ryan mentioned, there can, be, it, there can be just a separation of a few votes. In 2022, two years ago this month, there was a city council race that was lost by just 30 votes. 30 votes separated. There was a school board race, just 16 votes. So your vote really does matter from the top to the bottom. It's not just the top of the ticket. There are people going for school board. They're going for uh, hospital boards, water boards, fire boards really important people up and down the ballot. So please be sure you do your research on them, find good candidates, go to forums, any way you can find out the information because your vote matters. Those good people are counting on you. Thank you. Oh, and if you wanna subscribe, you can email me, penny.harrington at cox.net or there are um, a couple of clipboards out in the lobby. You can sign up, please be legible so I can read what your email says, or you won't get it. <laughs> okay, thanks. All right, this is where we put Penny on the hot seat. What questions do you have for her? <laughs> I'm just kidding. All right, you guys, fact checker row here. All right, we are not fact checking at all, by the way. But, uh, oh, good. but we're going to start We're gonna start and try to do these as quick as possible. Um, you guys can go on and, and everybody in the audience can upvote these and we will do our best. But, but just to be clear, we're going to try to choose questions that uh, are most appropriate for tonight. If you've been close to answering them, we might mark them answered Great. just so we can get moving. Okay, so let's go right from the top. Um, what about Christian news outlets? Yeah. Do you have any recommendations? Um, I do. We actually have a resource on the website that um, talks about good places to get b biblical worldview information. Um, so I would do that. All, all Sides is actually on there, so they have the balanced one. Um, we like um, the Breakpoint is a good one with Colson Center. There are, there are just quite a few um, good outlets. World Magazine is, has been kind of one of my favorites for a long time. I think they do a really great job and they look at everything through a biblical lens when they do their reporting. Cool. Yeah. Okay. From a Christian perspective, how would you, how should we approach the issue of mass illegal immigration? Yeah. Um, prayerfully. I mean, I, I think from a Christian perspective, that's where we <laughs> want to start um, by realizing that um, we're we're talking about both an issue and people. So I already said that. But I, I think we need to encourage and push for reform when it comes to immigration. Um, the, the system that we currently have is not working. And um, I think that anything that sort of minimizes it to being some simplistic answer um, probably 
is not nuanced enough or complex enough. It's a, it's a difficult issue. So, Penny, you... I'll let you handle that one. Thanks. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Penny probably has like a 12-point plan that she can lay out, but... Um, what do we have? All right, they've handed me a mic, which is dangerous. Um, what is more important, a political candidate's character or their policy? This is a challenging issue. Uh, this is in my, and I'm, I, want you, I want you to answer this too, honestly. You disagree with me if you want, okay? okay. Um, here's my perspective, Ryan Paulson's perspective. I do not think that we have a candidate for president on the ballot that is a person of character. I really don't. And... Um, and so, all things being equal, I, I voting policy because I, I don't see somebody on the ballot who I would say I think that their character is upstanding. So if that's equal in both cases, um, then I would say that I would choose policy. Mm -hmm. And I, I, would, I would say it's hard to really know someone's character when all you have is news outlets talking about them and then what you see when they actually are answering some questions or maybe interviews, sometimes look behind the scenes at how they are in other situations, but ultimately it's who they put around themselves as they create an administration and then the policies that they have because those policies are what actually affect us in our lives. So I agree. All right, next one up. Um, should I feel responsible for the actions of the candidates that I vote for? Oh. Hmm. I don't really know. <laughs> Not fair. I never understood that. <laughs> Somebody has to Actually, teach me. I um, don't know how I can. I think when we talk about policy and we, when we talk about them being people of their word and keeping promises that they make, um, I think that we need to have a higher level of accountability when it comes to um, the people that we elect doing the things that we elect them to do. Um, and so I don't, I'm not exactly sure that I understand the question fully. Um, I don't think that we are personally, personally responsible for the things that they do. However, I do think that an elevated level of accountability is healthy and good and will be for the betterment of our country in the long run. I, I would agree. I don't, I mean, I'm, I, I'm assuming that maybe somebody get, has been read the riot act because they voted for somebody and that's like, how could you? Did that happen? Has that I, happened? Don't, I, don't, I don't know, maybe. Maybe. Could it happen to me? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's, let's talk about, we have a few questions here about Christian nationalism. The first oh. is just, what does it mean? I don't know. I really. It depends. Um, and the, there's not a biblical definition of yeah. Christian nationalism. Um, so I, like the caricature of Christian nationalism is the marriage of God and country in a way where country becomes idolatry um, and where essentially the United States of America being a Christian nation or returning to being a Christian nation is the deepest and ardent hope that we as Christians in America have. Now, I, admittedly, that, that's a caricature like painted in broad strokes, but that's sort of the essence of it when it's used as a pejorative. Okay, so the next question then is, should the church be endorsing Christian nationalism? Should the church be endorsing Christian nationalism? I would say no. no. I would say that that's dangerous um, on both theological and practical levels. Um, I think if you, if you research what happened with the, um, specifically the German Lutheran church during Hitler's rise to power, um, essentially what happened was that the church got too intertwined with the political, uh, with, the, with the government and with the Nazi party specifically in a way that prevented them from being able to be a prophetic voice against it. And so our distance from politics, in a sense, from government, at least, to have that distinction between the separation, quote-unquote, of church and state, actually is so that the church has the opportunity to speak into the state in a prophetic way, and it prevents the state from controlling the church. Right. So, um, I would say that Christian nationalism <clears throat> is um, potentially dangerous, and that, um, in that you can 
lose the plot pretty easily and that Christians can lose their voice also. Mm. Well, good. You just answered another question, so Which yeah. good job. Uh, separation it was of about separation state. of church, of, <laughs> church and state. So. Oh, yeah. Can, we, can I just add, if yes, that please, is a question? Please. So I think the misnomer here, um, uh, when people talk about the separation of church and state, one people think it's a constitutional issue. Um, it's not. I believe it was um, a letter that Thomas Jefferson wrote to the um, Danbury Baptists in 1802. And um, yeah? yeah? Okay, thank you. Um, and it actually was in designed to keep the state out of the business of church rather than the church out of the business of the state. And it was a protection of the church. Um, and so a lot of times we think think it's the opposite way around and opposite like hey you church members need to stay out of anything political that was not the intention of what jefferson wrote in 1802 actually it was just the opposite like hey state you you stay out of this space this is ours we worship jesus exactly all right so um we're gonna move into here we go uh jesus was abrasive confronting the pharisees most Christians are too afraid to confront the evil going on. How do you suggest we speak up? That there's a pastor question. <laughs> <laughs> this is it. Um, my whole second section was on how I hope we speak up. So I hope we speak up in a way that um, is in line with Jesus's teaching on the Sermon on the Mount. And I think it's important to realize that, that this question is, is spot on. He was abrasive in confronting the Pharisees. And the Pharisees were the religious leaders of the day. The Pharisees were people in positions of power. The, the Pharisees were not, he, he approached the woman caught in adultery way different than he approached the Pharisees. And so I think it's important for us to be aware of who it is that we're talking to when it, so that our posture can be in line with the way of Jesus. And certainly, sometimes there needs to be a stern word spoken, truth spoken. But, um, but we always speak the truth in love, hopefully, um, even when we're speaking hard truth. And so that's, that would be my posture. Penny, what would you want to add? I said it was a pastor question. Okay, fair enough. But no, I agree. I, I agree. Speak the truth in love. We just need to be kind in the way that we share what we believe yeah. all the time. All right. Uh, what passages of scripture do you lean into when navigating political issues? Yeah, I mean, this, this is a tough one um, because I would say that, that it's more, the way that we engage politics is more about our Christian identity than it is about pulling a verse potentially out of context and saying, well, here's what the way that we should vote or what we should do. So political um, passages would be Matthew chapter 22, Jesus speaks to this directly, um, Romans chapter 13 talks about respecting our government. Like that's been a high value of Christians from the very get-go. Um, but I would say that it's, it's more about seeing the heart of God on the pages of scripture, seeing God's heart for his people and God's heart for people that have never heard about him, um, that that should inform the way that we go to the ballot box as much as any one specific verse. Does that make sense? Okay, yeah. what would you add to that? I would just add verses particularly about life yes. in Psalm 139. You can go there with how, you know, we were formed in our mother's womb um, and that to also choose life yeah. is in scripture. So there are some things policy-wise that we can lean into that scripture speaks directly to. Yeah, amen to that. Uh, next question is <laughs> if, um, if we don't vote as Christians, are we guilty of being lukewarm and have no basis to complain if our worst fears come true? <laughs> yes. Um, no, I mean, so here's it. I'm going to invite you behind the scenes a little bit. Don't hold this against me, okay? So um, Penny and I are meeting, and I'm like, Penny, like the Anabaptists have this long tradition of political, just like they just opt out, and um, and then like the Amish, they like make fireplaces, like that's what they do, like they're not. They're not involved in, in politics, and that's a viable option for Christians. And she pushed back on me and was like, absolutely not, Ryan. Like, we live in a republic. Like, we have the opportunity to vote, and she won me over. Um, I, I, 
I voted in every election, by the way, but I do think that it is, <laughs> that it is, it is our responsibility as a way to love our neighbor, as a way to love our neighbor. We've been given this gift and I don't think it's wise to opt out. Um, even if people could make a biblical case for that, I don't think it's wise and I don't think it's the best way to love our neighbor. Um, and so uh, 42 million Christians don't vote. Are we guilty of being lukewarm? Um, and uh, we, we would certainly have no basis to complain. Right. I, I would agree with that. I, don't, I wouldn't judge somebody's spiritual um, temperature based on whether or not they vote, but I would say that they missed an opportunity to change the things that they deem that are evil, to lean into and approve the things that they think are good as a way to publicly love their neighbor as themselves. My faith votes. Jody's faith votes. Faith votes. Yeah. Dot com. <laughs> My faith votes. <laughs> um. I, would, I would just add that, you know, as part of being salt and light is participating in the process and loving your neighbor. Yeah. Because if we're voting for policies and people to enact policies, we're trying to vote for the ones that are going to help our neighbors too. Politics is really just about our public life together. Yeah. And so... How do we live together in a way that honors Jesus and points people to him? One of the ways that we are blessed as Americans to participate is, is through voting. Less what? If we all voted... Well, I, I think we need to all participate as much as we can, and that will, that can only help. Um, how can we get younger? All right, I have a young college student sitting next to me, and so um, how can we um, get young college students to get out the vote while being aligned with Christian values? And by the way, he is not a college student at all, but anyway. <laughs> Does Jake want to take that one? Yeah, Jake. Can I get Ryan Lundy to the stage? Tackle it. Um, but no. Uh, Jake is a part of the Biblical Citizenship Committee, sure. by the way. Sure, take it, um, Jake. I, sure. Uh, I can't stand up because there's a table in front of me. I apologize. But um, uh, young college students are, in Dennis Keating's words, um, some of the most passionate people he's ever met. And uh, I believe he said something along the lines of, they'll attack the gates of hell armed with nothing but squirt guns if you let them. <laughs> um, which is awesome. Uh, but one of the main things that we have to remember is that they're early in their life, um, as I guess am I, and, uh, and they don't always have the best framework to address all of these issues. Um, so they're dealing with things like passion and emotion and working out of those. And that's not a bad thing because that's what gets them active and gets them moving. So uh, I would just say talk to them. Talk to them and work with them and, and listen to them and understand where they're coming from before you just respond and override, uh, override what they're saying. And then work within that framework to bring them to the point where they, uh, they don't feel overwhelmed by a lot of what's going on politically uh, through the measures and the ballots and the candidates. Uh, a lot of them, that's how they approach it. They get frustrated with all of the details and don't understand that it's a system that requires uh, some compromise and some, some work to understand. And so... Uh, if you can help guide them through that and not override what they're thinking while you're doing so, I would say that you're going to get them out in droves. Uh, I'm, I'm going to, I want to add to that just a, a one just little nugget, and it's that um, college students uh, are thoughtful, um, and they are um, skeptical of people in positions of authority because they've been burned. And I think um, a level of honesty with the both successes and failures on both sides of the aisle is something that draws people in. A false sense of triumphalism probably is off-putting to many college students. And so honest dialogue is the best way, I think, to engage young voters um, and to invite them in. That's a great, great, great answer. Hey, um, we have been not allowing um, any comments, but um, I do have to make a quick comment while, um, while I like add this star. on the screen here. Um, this is our warning. 
I decided to add, allow one comment. I decided to allow one as the LA guy. Um, by the way, this is just, this is to pause everything to let you know that it is eight o'clock if you have kids over in the nursery and uh, kids building. We would let's appreciate do, it. Let's you, do two more. We're gonna allow, uh, we're gonna keep going a few times, but if you do have kids, this may be the minute to go. So we'll keep going. All right. Okay. Sorry about that. All right, here we go. Bomber. It, yeah. In Acts, the early church sounds a lot like socialism. However, most of the theology outside of that sounds rather conservative. How does that reconcile? I take it. I um, yeah, so socialism is typically a system of government and economics that you wouldn't have the opportunity to opt into. Mm -hmm. So um, what we see in the early church is communalism, not socialism. And there is an open-handedness with their property, their money, and their things that isn't guided by any sort of person at the top that's benefiting off of it. It benefits everybody. And so I would say it's not, it's, I, I wouldn't term it socialism. I would say that it's communalism and that it's healthy and life-giving. And I think socialism has proven um, that it is less than that when it's played out on a large scale. Good. Mm -hmm. Good to me. <laughs> um, Penny, did you have more to add? No, I'm good. Oh, okay. Um, why do some Christians equate political platforms with their spiritual beliefs? Why do some Christians equate political platforms with their spiritual beliefs? Uh, I think, well, you it, go ahead. No, they're probably just. So I would encourage you, there are links to the platforms in our resource document if you want to read them. The Republican platform in particular was changed this year, and Pastor Ryan mentioned a little bit of that. So um, I, I think we need to see what aligns with what we believe. Um, there's probably no perfect alignment Correct. with either one. So it's a matter of your taking your biblical convictions and looking and seeing, and then looking beyond that even to the candidates themselves and seeing what they personally stand for. And because um, some of them may not completely follow that themselves, one or the other. Yeah. My, my answer to this would be, how, how could they equate the political platforms with their spiritual belief? I think it's dangerous, obviously, but I think to not have your spiritual beliefs influence the way that you view politics is a misnomer about spirituality in general. Like sometimes we view spirituality as this like separate thing um, that we have or do. And yet I would say that, that being a disciple and a follower of Jesus should impact every sphere of our life, including our public life together. And so to not have your spirituality influence the way that you engage politically I think is a, um, a misnomer about the way that God has wired us as spiritual beings. All right, next up, should we support, uh, there's two more, should we support politicians that support uh, children's sex changes and hormones? Doesn't God say he created men and women? How do we vote to support the gospel? You want to go for that, Pastor? Yeah, you talk, sure. you talked about yeah. parental rights and yeah, the par uh, parental rights are are a huge thing. Um, so this is, man, I I would hate to give a just a short soundbite answer about the LGBTQ um, issue in our day and our time. Um, so I would say that um, in general, my my stance would be that I would not support this. That, but what I would want to say is that there are people that are really struggling and really hurting and don't know which way is up. And, and the politicians aren't going to solve this, you guys. The people that are going to solve this are people that are going to love and invest and really show up for kids that are in those kind of situations. And so, yeah, I mean, I, we can't have policies that allow... Um, children to have sex changes and hormones, especially without any parental involvement and uh, 
the way that that's played out in Europe is just insane. I don't know if anybody's tracked that, but that is an absolute disaster of an experiment that they're, that they're experiencing on the other side there now. But um, people are hurting. And as the church, I think we need to figure out how to love and invest and speak into it. That's my answer. I think this is an issue that we're going to see a lot happening over the next few years. You mentioned Europe and some countries there are already actually backing off from it and saying, Big time. No. Fascinating. Yeah. No. And yep. we're almost, we're behind them. Um, 40 years. So, yeah. Uh, so I, I think we're going to see some major changes in this from just kind of something that's cropped up as almost a, a social contagion sort of thing in some cases, especially with young girls. And we're realizing as more D-trans people come out and say, I made this huge mistake, don't make it too, that we need to be compassionate about them and allow their voice to be heard so that it maybe doesn't happen to some other kids too. Yeah. All right. And the last question. What's that? Oh, yeah. That's available online? <clears throat> Not. Okay. Okay. All right. And the last question for tonight. Um, we're called to love our neighbors as ourselves in a nation where there is so much disunity between opposing sides. How do we bridge that gap? Yeah. And my, my vision would be that it's modeled within the church. I mean, um, things typically start within the, before the church ever impacts the world, the church has changed. And um, I think the unity that the church displays and exhibits and lives out um, can be a picture for the rest of the world of the way that um, it looks when Jesus is king. And so I think to have our house in order, as it were, to say we may not see eye to eye on all of this, but um, we respect each other, we love each other, we're gonna challenge each other. Like Penny's done with me and I appreciate it. Like we're gonna challenge each other and push back in love and we're gonna change our minds when we find out that we think we're wrong. So there's a sense of humility there too um, that we should have. So I think we model it inside in a way that hopefully starts to influence outside. Yeah, and, and you mentioned how some people just hate someone who doesn't agree, agree with them. And I think we need to be the ones who say no I love you, we just disagree, and be the one to reach out the hand. And when you find somebody that you disagree with, instead of being disagreeable and getting angry with them, I like to try to ask questions, like put the stone in their shoe, you know, so they start thinking about it. Oh, maybe, hmm. Even if you don't handle, you know, settle anything at that point in time, maybe it gets them thinking. Almost like sharing the gospel with someone too. You know, give them an opportunity to think about it. You don't necessarily have to agree, but always get them to think about it and try to do it in a kind way. Great. We're done? Well, there's lots of Thank questions. Thank you. <laughs> you guys, thank you so much for coming tonight. Um, if we didn't get to your question, it's because we were scared of it. Um, <laughs> no, I, I, thank you for coming. It means a lot to us. Let's pray before we go, okay? Lord, uh, you command us to lift up uh, our leaders to you, and so we do that tonight. Or those that you have put in positions of authority and leadership, we ask that their hearts would be soft towards you, their ears would be open to you. Um, Lord, uh, we lift up every person that came tonight. Father, we, um, we take it seriously, the fact that you've called us to be salt and light, and to be your disciples. Would you show us what that looks like, especially over these ne this next month that we have together? Would we be a voice of love and hope and reason and love? And Father, um, I pray for uh, our involvement, not just nationally and, and even on a state level on ballots, but that the issues that are close to our hearts, we would find ways to make really real meaningful changes right here locally in our backyard. So for the issues that are close to our heart, um, I think of even um, alternatives, we lift them up to you. God, for um, every person who's running for school board, our schools are just um, under attack in so many ways. Lord, would you put the right people in the right positions? And then Lord, for 
uh, our, our future president. We ask that you give our nation wisdom, please. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks for coming tonight, you guys.